I want to begin my message this morning by reading a letter from a Syrian pastor a couple years ago. And he wrote that letter off his phone as they were waiting to die during the Syrian crisis. And it began by saying, awaiting death. It was an email that I had to write. I'm not sure if the reception will work as I send this email, but I'm here sitting in the darkest room that I've ever been, and now we're receiving light one hour a day just to keep things going. We are in the middle of the night, awaiting to hear whether others in my building, while others and I in my building are playing seek and hide with death. As I write this email, another bomb just hit the building next to us, and people are screaming. So far, we have been spared. But are we next? When will it be our turn to die? Should I stay in my bed so that I will just die in peace? Or should I run to the ground floor of the building so that I may be able to escape? How long should I stay there? Should I try to sleep? Or it will be better to die while being awake. That is a letter that was written by a Syrian brother, a brother in the Lord. It is a time of crisis in our world today. I'm afraid of turning into the news. But here and there, I pick up what is happening, even with the current crisis in, Sir I mean, in Ukraine and with the Russians. The world we're living in right now has about 80 million refugees. 80 million refugees. About 12 million of those are from Syria. Right now in Ukraine, um, it's about 6 million refugees. Since World War II, there has not been a flood of refugees in Europe until now. We often forget this people. Brothers and sisters, these are the same people that Jesus Christ has concern for. And we cannot forget the people that Jesus cared for. It is our God-given responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ not to forget those that are dying and those that are suffering persecution. It is our God-given responsibility to pray along with them and do everything we can to support them. Six million. The scriptures that was just read just now, the word of the Lord says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and it has anointed me to preach good news and to proclaim it. To the poor, to the prisoners, to those that have no sight, physically and spiritually, to set those that are being oppressed, and to proclaim the Lord's favor. Jesus Christ made it very, very clear from the beginning of his ministry. That he came to minister to those who needed it the most. If you are here in church today because you heard of a Nigerian guy 
and you were thinking uh, it's all about Nigeria today, and then you have missed the point of coming here. If you were here because there were certain expectations that you had and you were coming for that, then you have missed the purpose of why you are in church. If you came to listen to me, and then I'm going to fail you today. But if you are here to worship, my Bible tells me that the word of the Lord does not return to him void. So if you are here to worship and to offer yourself in worship to God, you will hear the word of God. By the way, I haven't even turned my, my stopwatch yet, so I'm going to turn it up now. <laughs> oh. My two hours starts now. <laughs> Jesus, the Prince of Peace, was going around investing his time and resources to people who knew very little of peace. The ministry of Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago is the ministry that the church needs to fulfill today. We should go around bringing the word of peace. Peace be unto you as we fellowship with one another, representing Christ in everything that we do or say. If there's any time that the ministry of Jesus Christ is more relevant or should be more relevant, it's today. I know you guys want me to talk about Nigeria. I get you. Come back at 3 o'clock. We'll talk about that. But right now, we need to look at what the Word of God says. Christians are being beheaded for their faith in Jesus Christ. Children are being taken into slavery. Women are being forced into all kinds of pregnancy, not by choice, but through rape. Christians are constantly being heard for what they believe in. Churches are being burned down and destroyed because it's a place of worship. People are losing their lives and here in Lower, Creek, Lower Deer Creek Mennonite Church, you are blessed that you sleep in peace. I repeat, you are blessed beyond measures and you sleep in peace. You are not being threatened for coming to church. That does not mean everybody around you has it as good, as easy as it is. Christians are being kidnapped. I repeat, Christians are being kidnapped, even in my city, where I come from today. It's, 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 you, some of you have no clue what is happening in life. Wake up. I'm here today to bring a little bit spice into the food that we're eating in worship today. Well, next time I think uh, Marsha needs to invite me. I think I need to lead worship. If, you, if I come back again next time, if you let me come back again, I think I will lead worship. We, we need some mm, uh, in that, uh, you know. Um, I, I wanted to dance, but I kind of like looked at everybody, uh, you know. Nobody was dancing. So I didn't want to just, I mean, I already, st st I, I stand out already, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, and I just want to let you know, if you ever invite me again, brother, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little different, okay? <laughs> just, I'm just giving you a heads up right now. Uh, every time I have the privilege of traveling to Nigeria, my heart drops. I'm afraid because I know I'm taking the risk. I know I'm blessed to be here, but I had to choose between living in the comfort of United States or being a blessing. I still have my family, immediate family and extended family and loved ones. That's still home. So am I going to allow fear to keep me here? And I'm not, I mean, I have another Nigerian who I just met Sunday. Yeah, that's a name, Sunday, meaning he was born on a Sunday. So go, you ask Lynn how he figured that out. It was Lynn that got Sunday, uh, you know. But we'll talk about that at 3 o'clock instead. But every time we have the opportunity to travel back to Nigeria, we're taking a risk. And it's a risk worth taking. I repeat, it is a risk worth taking. 
I'd rather die serving Jesus Christ than to die in the beer parlor drinking. I'd rather die doing what is right than to find myself doing the wrong thing. I've traveled to Damascus. I've seen Christians there that are being persecuted. I've traveled to Iraq. I was in northern Iraq, city of Mosul, or the former Nineveh, where Jonah preached the word. I've been all to all those places uh, where Abraham came from. I wanted to see the footsteps of the stories and make it close to my life. Brothers and sisters, do you know that the Yazidis are being wiped and the Christians are being wiped even in the Middle East for their faith? Do you know that you can buy a kid for $150? A human being, a Christian, a Christian child is being sold for $150. And we are still living here in Lower Day Creek, not feeling any threat. I love the way you guys live here. You know, it's not as hostile as California is. You guys don't even have fences. Your eyes are all open. I mean, I think that's how heaven is going to be. You know, uh, it's just out open. Everybody is all free. The first thing I came in here, the message that I got really clear was you guys have nothing to be afraid of. I was here. Steve walked in, showed me the church. We were walking out. He didn't lock the church. Uh, dude, uh, are you not going to lock the door? Oh, thank you. He went in, locked the inner door, and still came out and left another door open. <laughs> I didn't say anything because I already said something. <laughs> I just figured out that's how you guys do it here. You don't lock doors. I don't even know why you need the door then. <laughs> just saying. But it tells me that you guys are living in peace. You have no fear of someone burgeoning in and killing you. None of us here has fear of someone coming here and destructing us. But as Christians, in this time of political rhetoric, God calls us to be the light of the world and be the light, salt, and light of the world. So what do you do? How do you do it? How do you respond to this call? Listen, serving God is not a competition, and we don't all have to serve Him the same way. Sometimes you need a little spice, and some of us have got a little spice. And because our food has a lot of spices, so we're a little bit on, we stand in worship, we have to move too, you know? The problem is, what you wondering why we move? We eat a lot of spices. You want to stop moving? Eat some spicy food. <laughs> what do you do to this call that God has called us to do? This is the moment when peace is so far away from a lot of people. A moment where persecution is growing and brothers and sisters in the Lord are suffering. You cannot sit on your holy behinds, in your comfort zone, and just think that this is how the world is. That's not how it is. This is one of the biggest growing Mennonite church in the United States. I repeat, this is one of the liveliest growing Mennonite church in the United States. Something is happening in the midst of you that is right. Whatever you're doing, do not be comfortable at where you're at because God is using you. He will use you above and beyond what you can even imagine or think of. But you cannot be comfortable at where you're at. When we talk about bringing the message of peace, it begins on our knees, brothers and sisters. When we talk about bringing the word of peace, it begins on our knees and in our personal walk with God. You must read the word on daily basis. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. It doesn't matter how long you have been a Christian. You could be a Christian for a week and you could be a Christian for the last 70 years. Thank God for you. But we're all in the same boat. And just simply because I have the privilege of standing here on this pulpit does not make me a better Christian than you are. But we must 
make time to read the word every day. God only blesses what he is involved in. I repeat, God only blesses what he is involved in. You wake up in the morning, if you involve God in your own life, he blesses you that day. If you wake up that morning and you had no time for God, you won't be blessed. And when you come back home depressed, tired, and angry, and had a bad day, you need to check back where God was God involved in how you started the day. The question is yours to be answered. How do we respond? Because we are incapable of solving the world's problem. I'm not here talking about Anabaptist Peace Center, thinking that I got it all figured out. No. No, I'm not the best Nigerian. By the way, there's no such thing as the best human being. God is working in us, every one of us. And if you don't think God has some more work to do on you, you've got a big problem. It is our responsibility to serve God by serving one another, serving those that are hurting. Every one of us are being urged it doesn't matter what political group you belong into. That is not our calling as God's children. It's not about politics. It doesn't matter who you voted for. What we are called to do is to be the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. I tell you this, do you, do, do you want to be called a children of God? Do you identify yourself as a child of God? The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all shall be added unto you. All, all. What is it that you need? We are called to feed the poor, physically and spiritually. And no one I have met that can cook as good as the Mennonites. The only thing we need in the Mennonite cookbook, spice. People may disagree with what we say, but let them not question. I repeat, people may disagree with what we say, but let them not question our lives and the work that we are doing in the name of Jesus Christ. Let it speak much more louder than what we say. If you think of the church and how it grew over 2,000 years ago, when the first church really grew, it wasn't so much about what they said, it's about what they did. And what you people are doing in Lower Day Creek here, here, I didn't say it well. I thought somebody corrected me. What you guys are doing here, it's amazing. I love it. When I was in worship, I was worshiping, and I even held on to Hank. Well, I mean, I can't believe it. Hank, what a name. <laughs> I don't know what it means. But, you know, Hank, I don't know. Tom Hanks, is that where you got it from? I don't know. Hanks, you people name children for no reason. Bush, uh, that's another one you got. Let us practice what we preach. Let me stay on my, on my notes here because I only got 10 more minutes, right? No, two and a half hours. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it's important for us to care for the church and care for the world. We are called to care for the church and care for the world. The Bible says in Galatians 6 verse 10, Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong in the family of God. The problem that I have with you Americans is that you are so blessed. Anybody has a pet here? Let me raise your hand. Let me just see my pet lovers here. Uh, no, 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 no. Come on, this is not a tricky one. I got three dogs. Come on, just raise your hand. She did this and put it all the way down. Don't be scared. I'm not going to hurt you. I know you're holding on to your bodyguard right there. But uh, just, just. Uh, you got a pet? That's right. How much do you spend on your pet food? In a year. Do you hear my question? Go back home and think about it for a little bit. The amazing thing about America is that you care so much about your pets than you care for other believers in the house of the Lord. I'm not saying it is wrong 
for you to have pets. I'm not saying it is wrong to care for pets, but God, for God's sake, if you are spending over a thousand dollars on your pets in a year, how much are you spending in the kingdom of God? The Bible says that we should care for those other human beings like you. Are you doing it? Now, I'm not trying to make, uh, part of it is I want to make you feel bad a little bit, but then I also want to make you feel good. Okay? <laughs> it's okay to help those that are in the church, but it's not okay to stop there. I repeat, it is okay to help those that are in the church, but it is not okay to stop there. The greatest commandment says that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart. But then Jesus volunteered the second one. He said we are also called to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. The question is, who is your neighbor? At this very moment in time, I'm your neighbor. That's your neighbor. That's your neighbor. Whoever is beside you is your neighbor. It's not only talking about the one acre property lot that is on the other side. No. When you are in the grocery store, the cashier is your neighbor. Jesus taught a very pretty simple principle. The principle is that we should love everyone. Compassion simply means action. To have compassion on people. Jesus was making a statement about immigrants in Luke chapter 10, verse 36. It's now, it says, now which of these three will you say is your neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandit? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who you have shown mercy to. I am sad to tell you I have been attacked in the past for being black by white people. I have a broken bone on my face. I have a broken bone on the back of my head. I have a stab and a scar for being black by a bunch of white kids. The first time I got attacked, I didn't even know what racism was. I didn't know why they were beating me up. At first, I thought they were armed robbers. I come from Nigeria. We don't know racism. We know corruption. There's another one over there. You can ask him. We don't know racism. In the western part of Africa, we do not know racism. Color doesn't really matter to us. We love white people. We love white people. I didn't get the reason why someone was beating me because I'm black. Folks, I didn't choose to be born black. I did not choose to be born a boy either. I woke up and I found out that I'm color boy. That's just a fact. You didn't choose to be born white. You didn't. So what makes you think you're better? No, you're not. I'm not better either. None of us is better. God intentionally chose to make us exactly who we are. You know, my 14-year-old son, when he was 12, he one time asked me, he said, Dad, why are you still nice to white people if they've hurt you so much? A 12-year-old asked me that question. And I said to him, Son, they hurt me in the past, but they're not hurting me today. And I'm not going to keep living in the past. First of all, right now, my understanding of the Scripture, if I hold on to that pain from yesterday, I'm not acting as a child of God. God's children don't hold on to unforgiveness. So I want to be a child of God. You know, this is an important question from a 12-year-old. And as a father of this 12-year-old, it is important the seeds that I plant in him. I repeat, as a father, it is important the seeds that I plant in my own son. And I said to my son, Whoever has hurt me in the past, I ended up, the person that even stabbed me, I led him to Christ a year later on because I made it a mission to become a friend of his. 
It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. But I made it a mission to become a friend of his. We live in a world that is filled with insecurity. But that's just the fact of the reality of the situation that we live in. But God calls us to care for the church. It is our responsibility to care for the church, to demonstrate sensibility in this insensible world, to demonstrate compassion to a world that is filled with injustice and corruption, to show the world what love really is and the word that has brought us to who we are. That's our responsibility to show. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3, the Bible says, Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in their body. We're talking about Ukraine and Russia right now. It doesn't matter what we think or how, who we agree with, whether you agree with Putin or not. It doesn't matter. But think about those that are being evacuated. I come, it's really very close to where I've been. I played in Lvov uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. I've played soccer in Poland. I know that about 4 million of those Ukrainians have been evacuated as refugees into Poland. It's really close to home for me. Yes. Yes, uh, there are some Nigerians that can speak Polish, and I speak Polish very fluently. And if any one of you want to test it, come, you're welcome to challenge me at the foyer after church. I like competition, you know. I love it when people don't expect a Nigerian to speak Polish. And, uh, you know, I was in Chicago. A side note, pause. Whatever has the time watch, yeah, you stop a little bit. I was in Chicago, and I was, um, I was driving, I mean, I was flying back to California, and there was this guy that didn't know that I spoke Polish, and he was just talking about, look at how black he looks. Oh, oh, he's so dark. Ah, uh, what, man, what kind of ape he was. And his wife told him, she said, you better be careful now. You never know who understands Polish. She said it to him in Polish. I sat there. I, was, I, did, I, just, I didn't know what to do. I just came from California, and I was flown into uh, Chicago for a thing, and they bought me a first-class ticket. I usually cheap, get the cheapest I could get. But this flight, they bought me a first-class ticket. And I was like, oh, man, oh, man, first class. And so, man, oh, man, I wanted to see what it was. Oh, by the way, um, when this guy was done saying everything he could say, I got up and I said to him in Polish, oh, Polska is still called Polakov. Jak ty nie lubisz tutaj, idź do Polska. Poland there's a saying in Poland, in Polish, that says Poland is only for Poles. And if you don't like it in America, you better go back to Poland. That's what I told him. And his wife took her purse. Me, I told you. <laughs> and I was in first class. And so we get to go in first. And when I got in, I ordered for tea. Immediately, they sat me and I was in the aisle. I got long legs. So I was sitting in the aisle with my little tea. Now I needed to drink tea like a princess from Disney, you know? And I wanted this guy to see. And then when he walked by, I was sipping my tea. I looked at him and I said, Czech. Czech means hi in Polish. That's so why I said to him, Czech. And he didn't say a word. Brothers and sisters, but you can turn the clock back on now. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 John 3 verse 18, Dear children, meaning God's children, let us love with words. Let us not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. That's what we do as the church of Jesus Christ. That's what we do, and that's what we are attempting to do. That's the reason why I'm here. I'm not here because I'm the better than your pastor. No, no, nowhere close. I've always been an accidental speaker. You know, some of you heard me for the first time at Ridgen because I wasn't even uh, uh, scheduled to preach. Um, there was another black guy that was scheduled to preach, and, but he got the COVID, uh, you know, and so they look mini, 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 more, and then they go, you are the next black guy that comes up. 
and that's how I got picked. And uh, hey, uh, Matt Hampshire, some of you probably know, and and, and uh, Tyler, they both called me. It's like, uh, Nemi, we want to meet with you. Oh, sweet. Now I must have got, you know, I talked too much. So I was like, maybe I got myself in trouble. I right? know because Matt and Tyler both want to meet with me. About what? Oh, uh, uh, Nemi, we want to meet with you. Um, about what? Uh, am I in trouble? And they wouldn't, oh, Tyler was bad that day. You know, and they wouldn't really say. And then they, they got me all wrapped up. And I was like, uh, so what do I do from here? And then, okay, okay, we're going to just cut it. Oh, we want you to preach. What are you talking about? Uh, we want you to preach at Region. Okay, we can talk about that later on. But anyway, and that's how come some of you saw me and then you came into the session and then we met and here I am at Lower Day Creek, brothers and sisters. But I'm just one piece of a puzzle in the equation and each and every one of us is a puzzle. I love America. I love Americans. I'm privileged to be called an American today. But that's, that's not the end of it. That's not the end of it. Some of you probably have not even flown out of Iowa your entire life. That's not good. First of all, get out. <laughs> what, will you say, where do you want to go? I don't care. Just go somewhere. Some people come and they say, oh, well, I met someone who was born in the high desert in Southern California and they've never made it to Beverly Hills and he was 27. It's like, what? You've never even been to uh, like LA? Yeah, get in the car. I took him from Hesperia, two hours away, drove him one way. It's like, now you can tell everybody a Nigerian guy came and picked you from Hesperia and took you to Beverly Hills. Get out. Uh, kids get out of school and it's like, well, we don't know what to do. Go to Mexico. It's just two hours away from us. Go to Mexico. I don't care. Park your car and walk. <laughs> That's how they do it. Don't take your car there. If somebody takes your car, I didn't tell you to do that. Park your car on the American side. Walk across. Don't take more than $200. Whatever happens, happens. Finish it over there. They say what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? No, just go. When you go to Mexico, whatever happens there, carry enough cash. Do what you would do. Just experience life. I tell them, if you don't know what to do, go take a trip and go to one of those villages and learn what's going on in their life and be a blessing on someone. If you can spend $1,000 on your pets, you can spend at least $10,000 on a fellow human being that belongs into the family of God. Because I believe we invest in people that take our investment into heaven. The Bible says that it makes that very clear in Matthew 6 verse 20 when it says that we should invest in our heavenly treasures. Are you investing in heaven? I can't answer that question for you. But if you leave this place and you find out that you're not investing in your, for your eternity in heaven on people that will go to heaven and take their, your investment along with them, then you need to think again. We need to fight for peace and justice, which begins on our need. Blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers plant seeds of peace, and they will harvest justice. That's what James 3.18 says. Peacemakers plant seeds. My response to my 13-year-old, who is now 14, was just seeds that I was planting. The question is, what seeds are you planting in your relationship with each other? At Lower Deer Creek, between husband and wife, between parents and children, what seeds are you planting? Do you come to church competing about what contemporary song needs to be sang or, or, or what hymn needs to be sang and how loud it needs to be? That is flat out dumb. I repeat, that is flat out. That's the biggest fight we have in the Mennonite church. How loud should the music be? And what hymn should we sing? What tempo? Who cares? Amen. <laughs> that is the dumbest thing to fight about. Serving God is not a competition. 
We're not here to compete against one another. We're here to plant seeds. Are you sowing seeds in each other's relationship, in each other's lives? Or are you taking each other for granted? Are you always coming to church because you are known for being stubborn and just criticizing everyone else? Some people, there's just nothing you can do that will make them happy no matter what they do. Folks, no matter how much bleach you give me to shower myself, I'm still going to come out the same last time I checked. <laughs> I met someone who asked if I had ever tried using bleach to shower. Talk about ignorance. <laughs> Psalms 55 says, As for me, I shall call upon the Lord. What that verse is saying, As for me, I will go before the Lord. I mean, if you are able to kneel, kneel. If you are not able to kneel, there are other forms of where you can humble yourself before the Lord. But the word of the Lord clearly calls us, calls every one of us. I wonder how you are praying for peace in your community. Or are you just taking it for granted because you got it in abundance? You don't even think about it. I found out that a lot of Americans don't even have common sense. I apologize, but it is true. A lot of Americans don't have common sense. And when they do things, I go, wait a minute. Why are you doing this? Well, but I told my son, I said, oh, uh, he's my talking buddy. Uh, the other ones in the house are quiet and nice and too serious. My son and I, are, we're cut out of the same fabric. So we stay, we hang out a lot, you know. Lynn just fits into my family just perfectly, uh, you know. We just go and go. And, 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 uh, and my son was just asking, and I told him, I said, listen. We are cut out to pray for one another. The Bible clearly even instructs us in the Bible, in Psalms 122, when it says that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Are you taking it for granted? That's a specific request. That's a specific request that God has given us. How are you praying for the peace of Iowa City, of a situation in Iowa City that you know of? How are you pay, praying for the people in Ukraine? That video clip that was shared, uh, we shared in the beginning of the Sunday School earlier on today, they mentioned North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, Nigeria. These are specific literal countries that are being persecuted for their love for Jesus Christ. Are you praying for those? Are you even aware? Some of you didn't even know that Christian children are being sold into slavery. I have a Nigerian pastor, Pastor Ephraim Langman, his wife Naomi. Their son was picked up from the university dorm and they could not find, they have not been able to locate their son in the last five years. Out of nowhere, they thought this boy has been kidnapped, killed, or something. He stole one of the person's phone one day and he called his mom and he said, I'm still alive. And I have been a slave of this and this, and this is what I am doing. While he was talking to his mother and his master's wife showed up and they took the phone. The mom could hear her son crying. And since then, they have not heard from him again. And here we are, living, enjoying, forgetting to do our responsibility. The Bible encourages us in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2, a very specific prayer request. <clears throat> it says, Paul says, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and from evil people. There's evil in our world. And some people say, well, I don't believe in, in evil. Yes, evil is real. If it wasn't real, it wouldn't be in the word of God. I'm a firm believer that whatever is in the word of God is there for us to understand. I just told you about the Yazidis uh, and, and the Chaldeans in northern Iraq. They're being persecuted. There's genocide going. 
a lot of you have no clue and you guys are so blessed with smartphones and internet and light 24 7 one of the biggest things that you have in america the biggest problem you have is you have too much food no i'm serious the biggest problem you have in america you have too much food and then you have light when my wife went to Nigeria for the first time with me, I was going to give my wife uh, the treatment of how I grew up. Well, what I did, I told my brother, just put a washer, only washer, no dryer. She's going to wash and she's going to dry it out. My wife was born in Poland, in the city. She has no clue how life is. Looks like, well, listen, she's just going to get a piece of it. So here's what's going to happen. We got home. My wife wanted to do laundry. She put that laundry in the washing machine. She started the laundry and the power went off. And uh, she is just waiting and she is waiting. Those clothes were in the laundry for one week. That one load, she did not finish it. And she's like, um, what, how do you do it? All the food in the freezer. And uh, Who thinks of a freezer when you're thinking about life? Uh, those two people at the back, they know what I'm talking of. If you've been a missionary too, you probably have an idea what I'm talking about. But there are people that are selling our children because, you know, we need to learn to speak up for those that are oppressed. Speak up. You know, we talk about the Jews and the Holocaust. Wait, how possible is it that history says that about 6,000 Jews were round up? 6,000! Jews were round up. How possible is this to put them in a gas chamber and burn them? How possible is it? Well, it's as simple as this. It is possible when we don't speak up for those that are oppressed. That's what makes it possible. You are as dangerous as those that are killing when you know that the killing is going on and you're doing nothing about it. But it's time for us, God's children, to speak up. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 31, verse 8. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the, right, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up. As a child of God, speak up. You cannot see a situation going on and you say nothing. I was in a restaurant last week with someone and... There was this black kid in California. This black kid ordered like six people's food. And he ate everything. And I was like, what? Yeah. And I was meeting with someone who has not been to church for over 30 years because he has been hurt from church. And I was just watching this kid. At the next table ran next to him. They finished eating. And they left tip on the table. I guess this kid that was eating didn't have enough money to pay for the six people's food that he ate in one sitting. Literally, I'm not making it up. One sitting, he ate six people. He ordered six different plates. He finished everything. But the table right next to him, they got up. They left a very nice tip because the server was good. And this guy got up and took that tip. The two tables right next to him did nothing about it. I got up, first of all, you know, I got up. I know I look scary enough. Uh, so I got up. I went to the next two tables that were there and they said nothing. I told them how shameful I am of them as American citizens. And this is how you watch people being persecuted and you do nothing about it. And you, first of all, let's go from you. I looked at the black kid. Now I need you to put that money back here. I need you to put that money back here. This is how we do it in Nigeria. We don't punch the walls. You put that money back here. We talk to people. We, you put that money. He put the money back. And I said, okay, now go and pay your money and get out of here. When you go, wait, who are you to talk to me? I said, first of all, my name is Nemi. I say it and I do it when I see it. I don't wait around. I was walking one day and there was this girl was pushing her mom's car and her pants was down here. Girl, I didn't say boy. Her pants were down here. I stopped my car in the middle of the street. I blocked everybody. 
I went, I didn't help them. I told the girl, pull out the pants. Pull up your pants. She pulled it up. I said, okay, now I can help you pull. Push your car. Brothers and sisters, when you see things, you don't go by it. You speak up. As little as a tip that someone stole and you say nothing about it. Next time when you see someone hurting, you're going to keep quiet about it. That is not who we are as God's children. We're being called to fight. It doesn't say literally go and fight, but we can defend by using words. I told you at Sunday school today that I've sued some people that are mistreating pastors' wives and widows and orphans. I told you about it. It's not that I'm there looking for people's fight, but I'm there to speak on behalf of those that cannot. You know, it can happen to you, but it comes down to what you believe. The person that says, I can, and the person that says, I can't, both are right. It comes down to what you believe. You know, I was told that I would never be able to read. I was told that I would never be able to amount to anything. I was told that I would never even live in America. Less what? Last time I checked, and I'm an American citizen. And this person that told me I would never be able to do that is a family member. And every time I go there, I flash my American passport at him, and then I go on. The problem is a lot of Christians don't act like Christians. They act like atheists. They act like unbelievers. If you are a child of God, then you need to act like one. My Bible tells me in Matthew 9.26, the 9.29, that it shall happen to you according to your faith. If you believe in miracle and you ask your heavenly father to come through, he will come through. I don't care what anyone else says to you. What you believe carries the weight. We are to give generously to those in need and always have hope. In Acts chapter 11, verse 29, the disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. If you go through this entire text, brothers and sisters, when the church, the first church was struggling, they reached out to those that had the funds and said, we need help. The church needs help. And come over and help. When it comes to serving God, even with your resources, it doesn't matter how little it is. In the kingdom of God, if you have one or you have 10,000, whatever amount you give, you are to give. This text, look at it. It says, give according to your ability ability it doesn't say give below what you have or give more than what you can no it's dumb when you go to some of these prosperity churches and they make you give until you don't have someone is sick and they need to go to the hospital and they take their hospital money and they are given to some prosperity teacher that's wrong that's not biblical i know the master physician is our lord and savior jesus christ but hospital is another tool that god has prepared for us here on earth as well it's a tool i don't believe in these people that say well just believe in your miracle and don't go to the doctor that's dumb too i hope you use dumb on the pulpit okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> not well, if I don't come back next time again, I guess I've used enough dumb. But we are given, we are to give hope to those that have no hope. We are to pray for those who have nothing. That's our call. We are to give voice to those that are given. And also we are to show hospitality to strangers. The Bible says that we are to show hospitality to strangers. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 21, do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner. For you were once foreigners in Egypt. I tell you this, unless you are a native American, all of us here are foreigners, period. It is just a matter of fact that some of you came here a little earlier. That's it. Maybe you came from Ukraine, Poland, Russia, I don't know, Holland. 
Uh, Menno Simon comes from Holland, right? Yeah. Well, where, where is your roots? Sweden? Denmark? Germany? All of us are foreigners here, folks, unless you are a Native American. So what sense does it make when you see other foreigners around and you make them feel uncomfortable? You are called and instructed by the word of God to welcome foreigners because you were once foreign. Maybe your grandparents were here before we got here. That's fine. Bible says in Leviticus 19, when a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your own native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Back in those days when the Lord says, I am the Lord your God. It's like if you want to argue with me, let's talk about it. You're going to lose if you want to argue with God. God is saying, stop being a hypocrite. Remember that you were once like those ones that are coming in right now. I know we may not agree with all the immigration policies of the country right now. It doesn't matter. Look, for, for us as the church of Jesus Christ, we have a specific, specific task and calling upon us to do what is right, to treat them right. Once we see them in grocery store, you know, stop, pay attention to them. The Bible says, I'll round up this way, in John 16 verse 33, in me, Jesus says, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. No matter what conflict is going on in your home, in your heart, in your community, in your marriage, in your family, you can come to Christ for comfort. Brothers and sisters, I don't know you individually, so maybe some of you are here because you were told that some Nigerian kid is doing something in Nigeria. Come check him out and you are here. But maybe you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you've been coming here even for all these years, but truly deep inside you, you are not a Bible-believing follower of Jesus Christ. Today needs to be that day that you make that change. At least consider it. You have a wonderful, great young man as your pastor, a very insightful young man. I don't know where you find them. They don't make this type anymore. <laughs> this guy has some foresight. Uh, I, he blew me up last night when he walked up with Noel yesterday. And he's already planting seeds in the life of his children. That is our God-given responsibility. I... That was all you needed to do, to bring Noel to hang out with us yesterday we have dinner. I will forever respect you because I see the, see the Spirit of Christ in you. You didn't go around trying to do this. You're not worried about your church members. You're worried about the first church that God gave you. And you looked and you say, among this ones, um, if God is going to do something, it might be Noel. So right now, we're going to just plant the seeds. I know Noel sat there and go, well, you talked too much. It's like, well, that's the problem. So uh, next time, tell Noel to bring some hot pepper. You know, when I talk, she just push that. You know. When are you going to be a peacemaker? I'm here this weekend to talk about Anabaptist Peace Center. You know, I became, I was born and raised in the Baptist church. Never knew of the Mennonites till 1999. Never heard of the word Mennonite. Never even saw MCC in Nigeria, even though it's been there since 1957. Had no clue. Didn't even know the Mennonites were Christians when I came here. In fact, when I heard the name Mennonite the very first time, I thought they were the Mormons. Yeah, that's how sad. I knew nothing about. But guess what? I'm part of the group, and I'm trying to make a difference. And I know I can't do it alone, but we can do it together. I don't know what the Lord is putting in you, but we are called to be peacemakers. How are you planting seed? Show by what you do. I want to round up by praying. And I would like to invite you to bow your heads as we pray and close for the day. 
You may be here and you have never given your life to Jesus Christ. Not because you have not heard about it, but you have not really thought clearly because you take things for granted. I'm going to pray and you can pray in your heart, but then I also want to encourage you to hang around uh, and talk to Pastor Steve and a couple of elders here at the church and I will be around. Um, you know, um, but after this prayer, you, you, can, you can talk. We, we can figure out how we can support each other prayerfully. Dear Jesus, I come to you this morning recognizing that I am a sinner and I need your forgiveness. So Lord, I ask for your, give, for your, for your forgiveness. Lord, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again so that I will have life everlasting. Lord, help me. Even in my sinful life to be able to live according to the original purpose that you created for me. Help me to live right. Help me to walk right. Lord, may your will be done in my life. And if you've been a Christian, but you have not lived your life according to how God has designed it for you to be, and you are not happy, and you know it deep inside you, you can ask God for forgiveness, for not living your potential as well. Jesus, forgive me. I'm not just asking you a regular way like I always do, but today I'm asking you, Help me to be intentional about it. Lord, I recommit my life. I understand the privileges that you have given me. My sins have been forgiven. I'm blessed to be an American. I'm blessed to be living and having a roof over me. I'm blessed to live in a community that has no fear or threat and that can even walk around and leave doors open. Lord, thank you for blessing me to be here. But Lord, help me to be more commitment and to be more faithful in the work that you have designed for me. For I pray this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.